I, I think that people are overvaluing the. It's kind of an archaic thing. The right left tackle is so much more valuable than right tackle. I think in today's NFL, they're practically equal. Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast for Wednesday, March the 6th. I'm your host, Easton Fries, director of published content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. You can follow me on social media at Easton Fries. I'm joined, as always, by producer JT. You can follow on social media at JT underscore Runky. JT, how are you? I'm good. I'm excited to finally be out of Indianapolis, the boiled hot dog of America, and back in a <laughs> uh, good city, the Nashville. Boiled- Hot dog um, of America. That, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. No, I loved I love my time in because Indianapolis. It's true. Yeah. Um, but I'm so glad to be home. Yeah, I am. I was the con I think everybody at the combine, you get to the weekend and it's it has taken so much out of your soul that you just you you know, you gotta you gotta get home and just recover. And that's what I did the past couple of days. I'm sure that's what you did. Uh we're only starting today's show 47 minutes late, and that's my fault. And I have I have a, a confession to make. We've done 270. Well, I've done 275 of these shows and you've done like 200 some odd of them um, over three years going on now. This is the first time I ever just forgot that we were doing a show. Uh, I I was and I've been so busy today because I got back from the combine on Sunday and then my wife and I are going on a, a bit of a vacation tomorrow. And so it's been a lot of like flipping laundry and like doing things around the house to appease her and like get everything in order. And you know how it goes. And uh, I was just kind of running around today and then I look up and it's like four Oh three and I'm like, Oh no, I am not ready for this show at all. Um, so we had to push that back and now here we are, but you know, three years and 275 shows. I, th- I think I've earned one. It's not that today's show is not interesting. It is. And I spent all morning, like, here's what we're going to talk about here. And then we'll talk about this. And, and then it just, it's just gone. I just forgot all of it. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I've been sitting here for the last 48 minutes, so, you know, I can't really com- I'm, comment I'm very on that. sorry. No, I apologize to you, and I apologize to our listeners. Um, for the, those of you that are with us live today, we do have a lot to talk about, and we appreciate you being here. We're going to talk about some post-combine thoughts. We're going to go through some things that having uh, a couple of days of perspective, like distance from the combine, some overarching themes from that week that we think definitely changed the landscape of the draft as a whole. Some things that are being talked about as landscape changing ideas that I think are a bunch of baloney that we'll go through some things that I just, I don't think are going to stick and um, are just a lot of hype. We've got a lot of news going on around the league today, a lot of tags and a lot of guys getting cut and free agency is right around the corner. So a lot of those things we're going to talk about today, as well as I have, Some more thoughts on, and JT, I want to get your thoughts, and I want to get our listeners' thoughts on the order in which the Titans should address tackle and wide receiver in this draft, and some things that we've not, I know it may feel like we've we've beaten this to a a pulp, and it's going to get even worse as we go through the next couple of months, but this is a unique idea that occurred to me um, in the past couple of days. I think it's, it's worth talking through, so we'll get to all of that today and more. If you can do us a couple of favors first here at the top. Make sure you're watching with us live on YouTube. Go to Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. Find this live stream, and in the comment section is where you can join today's conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts, comments, questions, such as Gershon F. in the chat saying he loves the Hot Read waiting intro music. Thank you very much. A friend of ours made that. Uh, a friend of ours from college, JT and I, and, and we appreciate him for that. Um, we I feel like I could recite the – I could like hum the entire thing by heart because I've only heard it a million times at this point, but I'm glad that you enjoy it. Uh, and, and if you wouldn't mind subscribing while you're over there on YouTube, hitting that subscription button is the easiest way that you can help support the show and help us. We appreciate you doing that. It costs you nothing and it's very helpful to us. So thank you in advance. Um, oh, one more thing, JT, while you're on YouTube, after you listen to this live stream, of course, we have two full length interviews with two really cool guys that we have published. Both are up officially now, if I'm not mistaken, right? We've got both up. And so Trevor Sykema, head of draft con no head. Lead draft analyst, that's the title, right? Lead draft analyst over at PFF. He is the man when it comes to the draft over at PFF. And we have about 12 minutes of a conversation with him in full. We've shown some bits and pieces of it on the show. Um, if you've listened to the past couple of podcasts, but the full thing is available and it's absolutely worth worth listening to every minute of. And then Danny Kelly from The Ringer, um, 
We have like 22 minutes with him, and that's a great conversation, a completely different topic entirely we talk about with him. And so that's worth listening to. Go check out both of those videos when you're done here with us today. Um, I think you really will enjoy them. Today's show, much more. We cut out again. What? I think we we're cutting fine. out. You I think I we're checked. good. I just checked. Okay. We're good. I think. Cool. Sorry right, about that. Least. If we were cutting out, um, a much more informal show today than that we've had the past couple of days. I just kind of want to talk this out with you, JT, and with our listeners. I came away from the combine from a Titans perspective with a pretty clear picture. I think of what their first overall pick is going to look like. Se seven over, not first overall, first round, seventh overall pick. Uh, I think it, we are narrowed down to seven possible outcomes. And this is not all that different from what I would have told you going in, but I feel really confident about it now. So I'm going to lay this out and you tell me whether or not you think I've, I've covered all the bases here. I think at pick seven, it, it's fair to say it's fair to be confident in the Titans almost certainly selecting one of four players, Malik neighbors, Roma Dunze, Joe Alt, Olufishanu, right? The, the, Top two receivers not named Marvin Harrison Jr. And the top two tackles in this class do to perch the consensus board. I think those are the four most likely outcomes. As long as three quarterbacks and Marvin Harrison Jr. all go before seven, that means the Titans are guaranteed at least two of those players to be available for them to choose from at seven. So they may very well have some options there. There are three other scenarios that I see as possible but less likely. And those are the Titans trading down. Now that's probably my personal preference. And we can talk about that in a, in a minute, but I think that that's a pretty enticing option trading down. But of course that requires a trade partner. And I would say that only happens if there is a quarterback that falls to seven, right? That's the most likely outcome is there's a trade partner in the 11th, 12th, 13th spot. A, a, a quarterback needy team comes up and grabs that. Um, so trading down Brock Bowers, if for some reason they are just entranced with him, and he's there and all the time that they were talking about getting explosive playmakers and everybody assumed they were talking about a receiver. They actually meant the best receiving tight end in a long time in Brock Bowers. I don't think it's likely and I would not like the pick from a value standpoint, but I think it's it's on the table. And then the last one that I think is sneaky is another tackle not named Joe Alt, not named Olaf Ishanu. And this scenario is most likely Alt already gone, right? The Chargers at five. The Giants is six, whoever it may be, takes alt and their second tackle is not actually Olaf Fashionu. I keep saying it wrong. Olaf Fashionu, it, it's Tillis Fuaga, it's JC Latham, it's uh, Marius Mims. Uh, and I wrote down Talise Fuaga just because, based on what I've heard, I think that he's tackle two on more teams' boards than folks think. I think teams are NFL is, is really, really high on Talise Fuaga out of Oregon State. So, I think those are the seven possibilities. Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Joe Alt, Olu Fashionu, Brock Bowers, Talisa Fuaga, or one of the other top tackles, or trading down. Do you think do you think I've covered all the bases there? Is that is that fair that we've we've narrowed it to seven? I think yeah. I I mean it, it would be very weird for them to go any other way. Um, it would be a very, it would be the perfect smoke screen if they were to go somewhere else, like the defensive side of the ball, or, uh, who knows if they, I mean, if they wanted to completely strip it down and take one of the quarterbacks, it would be one hell of a smoke screen, but also they, they, it, they'd it make would, a lot of fans for themselves that way. Yeah. They, I, it, it would also be the biggest surprise in most shocking move and also probably the worst move that they can make as mm -hmm. an organization right now just objectively with where they're at with the talent on the team yeah. right now so i mean those are the most seven likely picks right there i think or options um i would probably i think i'm already down to five um okay. over you i would probably count out brock bowers and i think also just my personal preference to lisa fuaga i i would not take him at seven, I think that's a pretty mm -hmm. hefty price for a guy who, uh, despite the other two, is still more raw than those two other players. Um, now, if they like him and, and they prove me wrong with Bill Callahan and Bill Callahan and Scott Fuchs in the building, sure, prove me wrong. But I right. think the value on that pick uh, could be used better elsewhere. I agree. Um, and so, yeah, I think we'll 
we'll probably spend the next seven, seven and a half weeks that we have until the draft, which it's kind of wild to think only seven ish weeks until the draft. We got a lot of ground to cover between now and then. Um, well, I think we'll spend the next month and change discussing the merits of those potential options. And so it's nice to have that, na that narrowed down. Oh goodness. <laughs> the green screen fell. I'll let you fix My that. green screen fell. Uh, I, wow. I, yeah, I noticed. Um, that scared me. I, <laughs> you guys can see my face. room now. Hello. Look at I know. Room. Yeah, my we don't we don't room. just live in this ethereal plane of Broadway sports media logos. We actually <laughs> the Broadway are, sports media portal. The Right. Yeah, uh, we are in rooms in our homes. Um, let me transition to this next topic, because I want to break down the wide receiver tackle question. And I saw this. This thought was sparked by something I saw from my buddy, Mike Herndon. Um, <laughs> the morning glory show saying, make your bed savage. I'll leave that up on the screen for him to find when he comes back. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw Mike Herndon say, I'm not usually a fan of a team pigeonholing themselves into taking positions of need in the draft, but this is such a prime opportunity to land cornerstone pieces at premium positions that I just can't see oh, any quiet. other way that seven and 38 aren't tackle and wide receiver in some order. That's what Mike Herndon said. And I, I agree. Like, it, it's hard for, I think, anybody with any sense, um, pending what the Titans do in free agency, of course, not to share that sentiment. However, there's one thing that keeps sticking in my mind about how offense heavy this first round is shaping up to be, JT. Uh, I know you and I in a group chat the other day were having a conversation about this. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that the first round, the first 32 picks consist of 20 offensive players and 12 defensive players. I would bet a considerable amount of money that there are more offensive than defensive in general. And I think that there's a chance it's a pretty lopsided situation. And that is not really an indictment of this defensive class because there's a lot of really talented defenders available. It's more a, a reflection of how talented the top of this offensive group is specifically at quarterback wide receiver and at tackle those three premium positions that the teams want to target in the first round. You could see as many as six, seven, eight tackles go in the first round. You could see as many as five, six, seven wide receivers go in the first round. And I want to talk more about the possibility of that um, in a minute, but with the needs on defense that the Titans also have, because they have needs practically everywhere. I, I can't help but wonder JT if Tennessee's decision at 38 overall comes down to choosing between on their board, their offensive tackle eight or their wide receiver nine or, you know, edge four, cornerback five. You know, we, last year we we heard Rand Carthen continue to say, we're going to, what was the saying? We play the board, roll the dice, play the board, something like that. It was all about BPA. We're going to get the best player out there. And it's easy to just go full BPA when you need help everywhere. I'm still not off the train of, I will not be shocked in the slightest if they see more value in a defender there because of the offensive heavy first round and they don't go tackle receiver, even though I think they should, it would not surprise me. I think you would see that probably happen if they were to trade back and still get a key offensive mm. piece, because sure. then um, you, you were able to more efficiently target that, kind of wide receiver nine through 13 value there in the third round. And that's really something you can only do with a third round pick. Um, I, I would not be opposed to them taking the defensive uh, defensive player in the second round there as much as um, Titans fans and some media have kind of pigeonholed themselves into thinking. I think it, 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 if you do have a guy, especially with those, with the crop of cornerbacks that are in this class, whether right. it be a Nate Wiggins, Terion Arnold, um, Kamari Lassiter, Kamari Lassiter, Cooper mm -hmm. DeGene, uh, a lot of those guys, I think there is a possibility that they do fall into the second round um, just because of how it goes. However, I think the one caveat to that is that as we saw today with a huge uh, slate of news, there's going to be a lot of good options out in the defensive player market. Yep. And I think they're going to come a little bit cheaper than we expected because, and there it goes again, <laughs> uh, because of how, Just leave because it. of the, um, because of the, uh, now I've lost my train of thought. You know what? I, I want him to hear this. So I'm just going to repeat it. I'm just going to repeat it. Can you hear me now? Are you back? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. I was vamping because I need you to hear this, this retort. I, 
I, I was prepared to tell you why you were wrong because my answer to that question was different than than the answer you gave. But then you you kind of convinced me on that. Um, from a Calvin Ridley standpoint, I do feel like he's the only guy on the market at this point who would really convince me in that way. If that makes sense, like I think he's the only guy you could go get and really have folks comfortable with. Okay, if they don't go receiver at, 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 in the first second round, they can they can get by. Like it's not the end of the world. If you know if your big biggest wide receiver signing is a Hollywood Brown, is a Curtis is a Curtis Samuel, um, is a is you know whoever else is available. I I don't think you can. Darnell Mooney is not going to be that guy for you. That not going to move the needle. No, no. Um, I, here's what I'm afraid they're going to do a little bit. And we've talked a lot about how oh, you know they've got. They've got uh, Bill Callahan in the building now that can really make up for less talented offensive linemen at their disposal. What if they go and sign a Charles Unwenu out of New England? They go and get the kid out of uh, Vegas or they they go and they sign Tyron Smith from Dallas. Like, what if they go get a veteran piece or two and they have like two, three guys on the roster? You know, they start talking about how well, we we feel like you know, there may be a guy in NPF on the roster already um, who we we think that our guy can shape into a, a competent tackle. And then all of a sudden it makes wide receiver at one way easier decision for them. And then at two, they, you know, they may just go BPA. They may not address the tackle position. I, I see that as a possibility, not because it's what would be best in my, I think it would be foolish for them to convince themselves of that, but they just, they, they're leaning so hard into the, Bill Callahan, man, he's a wizard. He can fix these guys. He doesn't need the best talent. He can come in and make a pretty crappy group into a serviceable group. And I, I worry they're going to lean too heavily into that. I mean, I, I see what you're saying there because I, I know we still have a week and, and you talk about how, yeah, MPF could be that guy. Well, when we talked to Rand Carthen at the, at, at the combine, it sure sounds a heck of a lot. Like they still think that they can make something out of Andre Dillard. And I think that's something that's Thank going you. to be yes. very interesting yes. to watch as we get to fr- closer to free agency. That's a, that's still a contract that I, I is kind of scratching my head that they still wouldn't try to get out of, even if they think they can turn him into something. Mm-hmm. Um, just trying to cut him or or try to find an option that might be better with the same traits. Sure sounds What's his like market going to be. And- Why not cut him and then re-sign him to a whole lot less money? Right? I mean, you you really it, worried it you're going to lose option, him? Right? You really worried? It, it, it's an interesting idea, but I mean, from what Rand Carthen said, that exact scenario where it says, if we have someone on the, uh, I think the thing that we go back to is that Rand Carthen says about Andre Dillard, there's just some things that you can't teach. And, and if that is something that Bill Callahan can try to figure out, I mean, that would make sense. I, I would highly suggest against it, but um, <laughs> it would be a huge roll of the dice. Yeah, it would. Um one one more thing, and you mentioned this uh, a, a minute ago about how it's it's hard to feel comfortable assuming it's going to be tackle receiver in some order. And I mean, I just I, I think we've said it on the show a couple of times now, but flashback to March fifth, twenty twenty three, and we're talking about the Titans' first three picks, and folks are assuming, well, at least you know, you're at least going to get a tackle and a receiver two of those three picks. Like it's gotta be right. Maybe a quarterback in there too. They're going to address tackle. They're going to address receiver. And then they come out of those first three picks with none of those guys, right? They, they make a, a flyer pick on tackle in the f- six, fifth, sixth round. And then a flyer pick at, uh, on wide receiver for a special teams guy in the seventh round. So just, I, you know, I, I do feel like we have to caution against assuming that's the case. I know that people are leaning so heavily into it in the media as well. Like it's, it's going to be, it's got to be, I agree that it should be, but I I I don't think you're ever going to get me there on it's going to be until they just flat out say, yeah, this is what we're doing. Uh, I'm I'm not buying it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, let me ask you about this because I know you've done a handful of mock drafts this cycle, and this is along those same lines of of receiver and tackle. A, a big part of the thought process as to which to do in which order has to do with what you're expecting to be available to you at 38. And man, I, I don't, the more I consider this class and like how I think the board's going to fall, the more I'm just not in love with the second round receiver options. I like the options in the third round and I like the options in the first round. I, there's just kind of a gap to me. Um, you know, you look at the consensus board and it's like, who might be available at 38? 
you know, Xavier Worthy is at 36 overall. I don't think any of us expect him to for sure be there. It's a possibility, but I, I, you know, he, he had a really big week for himself. Troy Franklin out of Oregon, who everybody seems to be really down on. Lad McConkey, Roman Wilson, Xavier Leggett, Jalen Polk out of Washington, Malachi Corley. Like then that's really the edge of guys where you're not just flat out reaching, right? Because then it's like Tez Walker, North Carolina, Ricky Pearsall, Jermaine Burton, Jalen McMillan, Brendan Rice. You're not picking those guys at 38 overall. And so uh, I, the two questions. One. Do you think that they're going to pigeonhole themselves into we've got if you know if we don't go receiver in round one, we've got to get an outside guy in round two. Like it can't, we're not gonna draft a Roman Wilson because he's just he's small, he's gonna be in the slot. We're not gonna draft a lad McConkey because we don't think he's gonna work outside all that well. We're not gonna draft a a you know Xavier Worthy because of his size. Like if 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 you pigeonhole yourselves into big outside receiving talent at 38. Your options are really limited, man. It's like Xavier Leggett, come on down. That's the end of the list. You know, like Malachi Corley, maybe. Troy Franklin, maybe. Ke- Keon Coleman, if he's there. It's 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 bad. Do you get, have you experienced this when you've looked at the, the mock draft options? Sure, a little bit. But I, I think you asked me that question and let me ask you a question right back. Those same grouping of guys, let's, let's call it the four. Let's call... I think Adonai Mitchell kind of supplanted himself as a wide as a first round receiver this week. So let's let's draw four of them into here. Let's go Keon Coleman, Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, and then whoever you want. Let, let's say let's say Lad McConkey Leggett. or Leggett. You could take one Leggett. of those outside guys. We'll go outside yeah. just for the sake of the argument here. You obviously say that you don't feel comfortable with them at 38, but just take it back 10 picks and say. Would you be comfortable with one of them at 48 plus an extra fourth round? Yes. Yeah. And I think no. it, it's, yes. it's the small, either way, I think they're round two guys. I think it just depends where they go. Um, personally, I, I think that if you like one of those guys, you just got to take him. Um, and if not, you can get move back and just settle for the one that falls to you on the board. Um, so, so if, if all four of those guys are there and Roman Wilson, and they, you know, Roman Wilson is their clear of the, of that group. He's clearly their best receiver agnostically, just in terms of talent. But he does have that size limitation. He has that role limitation. Do, do you think that they pull the trigger? They're just like, we'll figure it out. We want the best guy available. We, we're, you know, we are much more confident in this guy, even though he's not necessarily an outside receiver. Or do you think that they they say, we, you know, we've just got to get a guy on the perimeter. So we'll skip him over. We, we don't think he's a good fit for our team. We're going to go with an outside guy and maybe reach a little bit. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that's really how Rand Carthen would operate, in my opinion. Um, we, I mean, he keeps continuing to say best player available, and if that's right. the best player available on their board, no matter, you, despite reaching, you go get your guy because mm-hmm. it's, it's at the end of the day, it's what the Titans consensus board is versus the national consensus board. It's never going to line up. So you could have, I mean, Kamari Lasseter, for all we know, could be twenty-five extra players down on their board versus a consensus board right so Mm -hmm. i think that we're never going to really know and we just have to kind of put what we think versus what they think and if they think that they have a guy in roman wilson uh who is going to be that that wide receiver that they can develop into a stud at the next level i think they go out and get him let me ask you this a question adjacent to this conversation we came out of last week you know the, the testing for wide receivers was on saturday afternoon and it feels like we now have six guys that, according to the public, according to a lot of those in the media, they are lock first round receivers. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Brian Thomas Jr., Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy. And you got a handful of guys that are talked about as they may sneak into the first round. Keon Coleman, the teams may just still be high on him, even though the public seems to be souring. Lad McConkey, a lot of teams seem to be high on him. But there's at least six guys that it feels like the zeitgeist to saying lock first round. Do you buy it? I I think at least one of those six guys has fallen out. I think that we do this every single year. I, I think back to last year when folks talking about like, you know, oh, the first receiver might be off the board at 10, 11, 12. Maybe the Titans consider going, going, you know, with the receiver at 11. And then we get the first receiver at 21 or something like that. We have three first round receivers and. And then, then the Cedric Tillmans and the 
um, uh, Jalen Hyatt's of the world were like second round guys, right? And then it's oh third round, fourth round, but At Perry in the sixth round. You know, it, it just they kept falling down and down and down the list. I'm not saying that this class is that class. I think this class is clearly better than that class. But I, I think every year we do this, we shoehorn in one or two too many guys into the first round when it's just not, it doesn't, it's not what comes to be. I mean, I see where you're coming from, but I think all five, I would say five of the six of those guys are better players than Quentin Johnston was. And, and he I, ended up going <laughs> in the first round. Sure. Um, I who, think who, now I'm curious. Who's the, who's the sixth guy you think he's not any better than Quentin Johnston? It's not have... putting it up. Oh, you know, you didn't first, have I'm saying first round I talent. I see. I got you. Um, okay. I didn't know if you had Xavier a Worthy, person Xavier in Worthy mind. is the one that I, I, I think that take. Xavier Worthy would be the one that I I'm still cons- that if there are any, uh, I would see him following out because of hmm. just the the preconceived notion that he is one of the smallest wide receivers to ever potentially play at the NFL level. I mean, hmm. he's a full 15 pounds lighter than John Ross was, and we saw how that worked out. Not to say right. that that was his fault, but I mean, the main concern with him was he's going to break and. He was kind of putting it together, but then what happens? He breaks, and he never really sees the field how, again. And how much lighter is he than Kyle Phillips? What did Kyle Phillips come in at? I would have I to look up Kyle Phillips' RAS, but I mean, if, it up. if Roman will, you could look at Roman Wilson, who also is smaller than how Kyle Phillips came out. Kyle Phillips, 190. He's that's got 25, almost, 25 pounds yeah. on Xavier Worthy. That's crazy to me. It's crazy. That, that and, Xavier, Xavier Worthy Worthy's is 5'11". Kyle Phillips, the exact same height. And he's got 25 pounds on him. And everybody talks about Kyle Phillips. Glass made of bones made of glass, skin made of paper, j- just muscles made of deli meat. He can't, you know, it's a he huge can't do gamble. It. It's a huge gamble. It's a, it's a huge gamble. Um, which is why I think he's the one that would probably maybe not make in, make it into the first round. I think it's gonna be very it's gonna be fit dependent. It's gonna be a team that feels like they need that specific type of guy because those those first Four, definitely five, I would argue, are guys that I think are pretty agnostic. Like Marvin Harrison Jr., any team could use that guy. Roma Dunze, any team could use that guy. Malik Neighbors, any team could use that guy. I think any team could use Brian Thomas Jr., and I think any team could convince themselves on using Adnai Mitchell. It's where you, Xavier Worthy is the first like non-vanilla or chocolate option at the ice cream store where it's like, Coconut pistachio. I'm not sure that's for everybody. You know, certain people are going to eat that up, but it's not He's like mint it's... chocolate chip. Okay. All right. Uh, that's more right mainstream than coconut. I don't know where coconut pistachio came from. Um, let me ask you about these two groups. Uh, this, and this is very scattershot, but I, I just, I feel like sharing these opinions today. I, I went through both the receiver class and the tackle class and tried to figure out where the drop off is because we keep talking about the Titans potentially trading back in the first round, right? Dan Brugler at the athletic came up with a mock this morning where he had the Titans moving back from 7 to 11 or 7 to 12, something like that, into the early teens and drafting um, J.C. Latham, tackle out of Alabama. Uh, We heard a report, I think, yesterday about the Raiders having made calls about the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th round pick, uh, round, 7th overall picks um, to potentially trade up and get their quarterback in the future. And so the Titans being one of those teams, could they potentially trade back with the Raiders to 13, I believe? If if they do trade back, you want to make sure you don't accidentally trade yourself off the cliff, right? You need to figure out where you can comfortably go to and still get one of your A-tier guys. And so for me, I, I think that the drop-off for the tackles is further down the list than the drop-off for the receivers. And that should inform how far they're going to move back because if they're dead set on a receiver in the first they, sh- you know, we, 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 we heard from Trevor Sycama, like if you, in his opinion, if, if the Titans want receiver, they should not trade back at all. They should get one of the top three guys. I think it's four guys in this class personally. And I, maybe, maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid too much, but I think that the drop off in this receiver class comes after Marvin Harrison Jr. On the top rung, one step down, Roma Dunze, Malik neighbors. I have them kind of in the same rung and then one rung down. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. I think Brian Thomas Jr. is one of those guys who I've been talking about. He's, he plays the same position as another guy in this class from the same school. Maybe there's an element of we just didn't, you know, we, we didn't see the full potential because they weren't the one necessarily. And it's going to be a different story in the NFL when they are the one or when they're given that opportunity. So I, I think that Thomas Jr. is in that class too. And then 
there's a there's a there's a gap, and I love that night, Mitchell. I, I think Xavier Worthy is intriguing. I think there's a gap before those next two guys. Is that for where it is for you, or do you think it really is the top three guys and then a significant gap before Thomas? I I probably would. I guess I'm higher on Adonai Mitchell than you are because you lump him I in. Think then. I would I'd put him very close to Brian Thomas. Okay. I think I think he is a pretty pretty considerable lock for the top 25. I think okay. there's definitely teams I think in that kind of space where where they will take the luxury pick and take a guy like Adonai Mitchell to make your wide receiver two and hopefully elevate that in in, in that situation. Um, but yeah, I kind of agree with you. At least the top four are, are definitely locked. I think Adonai Mitchell has an argument to be made that he should be up there. Um, but outside of that, I think after that, um, that's where you start to consider reaching in the first round. Where do you think the drop off is for tackles? Like, where do you think the the cliff comes? It's all Wherever... the fashion new. Then Fuaga in no particular order. Mims is in there. I would say Mims is in, there. in there. I would say Latham's in there. Is Troy Fatanu in there for you? Or is, is it I think before Fatanu where you cut it I off? think he's the bar. Um, so he's the last because one. He, he's either the last one. In, he's either the last one in or the first one out. Okay. I think that's the line there. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think that it, I, for me, I have him in. I just, I think that teams are going to value him too much and he'll have a shot to play tackle. Even, even though there are some length concerns just a little bit. Um, but there are with Fuaga too. He has longer arms than Fuaga, and uh, Fuaga is the guy that sounds like is going to get a shot at tackle wherever he goes. So, I I think that's the drop off. And so, just that's something to keep in mind. You don't want the Titan trading back sounds nice, and I agree. But if they trade back to twenty four or something, and then you know the the best tackle available is I don't know Tyler Guyton, and the best receiver available is Adonai Mitchell then I personally, I, I'm a little bit bummed by that, not getting one of those top shelf guys, I guess. It would depend, honestly, on the the kind of trade compensation you get back, right? I, I well, think. Can, can we talk about that? Like what, sure. what we think fair trade compensation would be? Because that was an interesting conversation this morning when Brugler's mock came out, and I'm going to pull it up here so I can get this right. He um He had the Titans trading back from, let me find it real quick. Okay, here it is. So Dan Brugler had the Titans moving back from seven to the ele- yeah, the eleventh pick with so the that Vikings. Would be with the Vikings, yep. Yeah, so they move back from seven to eleven, and in return, they get a fourth round pick, number one one oh nine overall, and then a second rounder next year. That's the overall trade package. And I read that and I thought I like the idea of trading back. I like who he did it for because I really like, you know, he went and, and drafted uh, JC Latham at Alabama out at, at 11. And I, I like that pick considering who was available. Um, and that's all good and great. And I hate the compensation. I don't, I don't think that's nearly enough for me. Uh, here, here's where I'm at JT. If they trade back more than, you know, if they trade back into the double digit picks starting at 10, essentially, the trade compensation needs to involve at least one of two things, a top 100 pick this year, like an additional one, a third round pick, a second round pick, whatever it may be, or a first rounder next year. I don't think you can make a trade back without getting at least one of those things for me. Yeah. I mean, I think in any kind of mock draft, you're always going to undervalue it because if you overvalue it, I think just personally, that's where you get kind of the hammer of fans coming down on you. That's like, this is not real. Re- like, right. You're in La La Land. Get a right. grip. But, but that's the thing, right? We, we see time and time again, uh, front offices overpaid to go get their guy that they think can alter the franchise. Um, I think a popular one is, is when the Bills trade with the Buccaneers to go get Josh Allen. Um, it mm-hmm. wasn't all of that. It was not that many picks in between where the Buccaneers were and the bills were. And yet I, they I have still it right gotta... here. I have it right here. It was the, the bucks, excuse me, the bills trading from 12 up to seven. And they had to pay two second round picks that year, 53 and 56. And they got back a two two fifty five overall. So I'd imagine a seventh round pick. Um, so that that's in context. That's essentially the same trade. And they got two two top 100 picks, uh, two top 60 picks that year in return, selling off a seventh. Another example, if you want a future first, I found the Eagles, when they traded to sixth overall um, 
excuse me, the, the Dolphins traded up with the Eagles to sixth overall to draft Jalen Waddle in 2021. And the Eagles went from six back to 12, very similar to the Titans going from seven back to 13, for example, with the Raiders. The, they got a fourth round pick, fifth round pick, pick swap that year. So the Eagles got to bump one of their fifths into a fourth and they got a first rounder next year. So that those are two examples of what you got to have, right? Like you got to have at least one top 100 pick this year, or it's got to be a future first. So if, if this trade package that Brugler put together was, um, you know, the Titans move from seven to 11 for the 73rd pick this year and a future second, I would have been fine with that. But something like 109, just, it doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so I think that's, that's a fair, I think that's important to, to just give a, a baseline of where folks expect what folks can expect trade back compensation and what you, what sh you should, you know, be okay with and what you should not be okay with. Let me ask you this now, JT, and we really are just all over the place today, but you know, I, I said to be informal, we're just gonna have a conversation about this. Um, the tackle situation for the Titans. I'm getting tired of folks talking about these tackles in this binary. And I think you pointed out a certain radio host, one of our favorites here in town was talking about this uh, at some point in the past couple of days. I'm tired of folks talking about guys who played primarily on one side or the other in college. Like they're legally bound to play on that same side in the NFL. You hear so much from, I think mouth breathing knuckle draggers a little bit. Like I'm going to go there. Uh, like, oh, you got to get, oh, if fashion new, you got to get Joe Alt because those are the only left tackles in this class, man, guys can switch. Like we've, we've seen it happen. It's hard. It's a risk. It's a gamble, but like do some basic research. JC Latham, for example, the strongest physically, I think prospect in the entire draft class for my money, just based on, on what we've heard in the tape. Um, He's somebody that has talked openly about how he thinks he could be a right or a left tackle. The only reason he didn't play left tackle in college is because he showed up when Evan Neal was at left tackle at Alabama. And then in his last year, when Evan Neal was not there, it, it, it's the, the last years after Evan Neal left. It's like, why would you switch him? He, you know, he's already here. We're going to draft or we're going to bring in our next left tackle to groom here at Alabama. Right. So he's a guy that played right tackle, but you're, you're going to tell me that Bill Callahan's going to look at a JC Latham and think I can't get this guy to be a good left tackle. I'm not, I'm not buying that man. Like it's different candidate to candidate, but you don't have to get, and here's another thing, JT. I don't know if folks have deluded themselves to forgetting this. The Titans need a right tackle too, man. They, they, both, both, both openings are open, but both positions are open. And I, I think that people are overvaluing the, it's kind of an archaic thing. The right left tackle is so much more valuable than right tackle. I think in today's NFL, they're practically equal because opposing defenses will line up their best. It used to be all about two things, right? Protecting the blind side of your quarterback when they're a right handed thrower, the left side is the blind side. You got to protect him. And in that way, that's still a thing, right? But the other thing is that the defenses, because it's the blind side, would traditionally line up their best edge rusher on that left side to try to get to the quarterback through the back door. That's not the case anymore. The best edge rushers in the league are constantly switching sides based on matchups and, and, and just, to, you know, based on formations and, and stunts and all of these things. So that's not a thing anymore. The only thing you're really accounting for is the blind side, but because quarterbacks are so mobile and pocket navigation, pocket movement by design, all of that thing is happening. All of those things are happening. Now you hear really, really smart people. Greg Cosell, I think went on, on his show with Buck rising the other day and was like, to me, in 2024 in the NFL, right tackle is like 95% as important as left tackle. And yeah, left tackles tend to get paid more generally in the NFL than right tackles. But that's because typically the better tackle is on the left side on most teams. But we're seeing in recent years a real shift from that. Panay Sewell, Rashawn Slater, these guys exist. They're the best tackle on their teams. They're playing on the right side. I don't think people realize that. Like the Titans could use either side and it's not like, well, left tackle is a premium position you can draft in the first round, but you can't touch right tackle with the 10 foot pull. Yes, you can. And the Titans need that guy too. And I think that's a big reason why um, 
I still continue to believe that Joe Alt is a very real possibility for a lot of these teams. Uh, not a lot of teams, the two teams in front of the Titans at five and six. I mean, mm. the Giants could use another tackle to bookend that side of the line because they still uh, have some pretty poor lo- offensive line play. And yep. then looking at the at the Los Angeles Chargers and Jim Harbaugh coming in, uh, just seeing his kind of uh, perspective there, right? Um having a guy like Joe Alt in which you can finally bookend your two sides of the line here with Rashawn Slater and Joe Alt, right? If you have those two guys on both sides of the offensive line right there, that finally gives Justin Herbert the opportunity to be Justin Herbert, right? And I think that's a very real possibility. Yeah, no, I I 100% agree. Um, And so I just, I think it's funny when folks pretend, or not pretend, but they're deluded into thinking, this is the way that it has to be that, you know, guys can't, can't switch back and forth. Like it's not a, like that, that is absolutely a possibility. And so um, that's something to keep in mind. Do we want to fly around the league a little bit with some news uh, looking at, at, at some things that, that have happened today and then we can get out of here. Yeah, sure. Um, let's talk about, I think there are really a lot of it. Well, first of all, we do have some comments here that I think are important to get to. Oh yeah. Let's answer um, some questions. Alex Titan says, and kind of what we just talked about, he says with more and more coming out, it feels like alt won't be available at seven. I think a wide receiver is inevitable at seven unless they love fashion. I think that's a very real possibility considering um, the, how much Brian Callahan and Rand Carthen have emphasized um, the wide receiver position, especially when we were at the combine and asked them all things equal, they right. would take, uh, a Malik neighbors and Roma Dunze over the tackle. And if Joe Alt is in fact gone, I think that right now, just from what we've heard and it could all be a smoke screen. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a very important thing and something that might really be possible there. But um, I think that in, in a vacuum Malik neighbors and Roma Dunze are the more important piece of the, of the tight, what the Titans need right now than a, than an Olu Fasha, Fashanu. Um, Alex also says really would like teams to fall in love with quarterbacks to give the Titans their pick of the liver sure. at seven, um, which I think with the, the cutting of Russell Wilson, I think that only the, that, that move today only increases the possibility of teams like the Broncos and the Vikings and, and the Raiders right there in the middle of the, the teens, just that, that trade market starting to ramp up even more and more. Can I say something about that, by the way, Th- this, I, I'm sorry if this applies to you. I really am, but it's just the truth. If if you were surprised in any way by the Russell Wilson news yesterday, where have you been, brother? We, we we've known this since December. We've known for months this was going to happen. I JT and I were sitting in the stands at Lucas Oil, Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis on Saturday, and I I'm pretty sure I turned to you at one point and said, "Hey, by the way, like, why is nobody talking about how Russell Wilson's about to get cut?" and be the largest cap hit in the history of the dead cap hit in the history of the league by more than double the previous record. Like why that should be a crate. And now it's a crazy story now that it's happened, but I've seen so many folks, some Titans folks that are like, this changes everything. No, no, it doesn't. Not if you're paying attention, it doesn't change a thing. We knew that this was going to, did you think that there's a chance Russell Wilson was still on the Broncos next year? What did you, I what mean, did you think? what do you think happened with that situation? Do you think the they just sat him down for fun? $85 million, man. Like, that's a lot of money. Like I know. It's crazy. But, like, if you read anything about it, you knew. He's for I, sure, like, I he's knew. getting cut. I, I, just, I just thought that, you know, like, I, I thought he was going to get uh, cut, but it's just a hard pill to swallow with $85 million. I, I think well, it's, it's so, fa- not to go too far off the tracks here, it's so fascinating because in case folks don't know this, like, Russell Wilson is going to have the opportunity to go play for a team next year and they pay him nothing. They pay him like a, a not just a rookie, but like a, a Brock Purdy rookie. And it, he's going to hit that because here's the deal. He is doing, he, you know, he signed a new contract with the Broncos when they traded for him. That new contract hasn't started yet. That starts now. Wild. Yeah. That start like they, the, the, the two years he was in Denver was the old deal. The new deal that he signed with Denver starts now. And so this upcoming season, he is owed $39.5 million guaranteed cash no matter where he goes and plays and the way that these contracts work if he goes to the Steelers for example and the Steelers sign him for a one year five million dollar deal that five million dollars offsets 
the 39.5 million due to him from Denver. So all it is, it's not money going from the Steelers pockets into Russ's pockets on top of Russ's 39 and a half from Denver. It goes to Russ and it makes the Broncos only owe him $34.5 million that year because it's, it's, it, it offsets is essentially how it works. And so it's just a charity case for the Broncos. So why would Russ, Russ's agent, Russ's new team, why would they not pay him $1 a year? Like, why would they not pay him the veteran minimum, whatever that number is they can get away with legally paying him? I think that they will. And I think that's what makes him like actually unironically an interesting ish option for teams that are really desperate. And well, in the thing about that, I think he's going, I don't think he's going to get the veteran minimum most likely because why wouldn't he? Well, it, it's, it's the kind of, uh, thing there where if he doesn't get paid enough by a different team, Stoney, we're so sorry to break um, this news to you like this. I hope you were sitting uh, down. If, uh, if he doesn't get paid, then some of that money that the Broncos would have to pay him, they don't have to pay him anymore. And as we saw in, yeah, in, in exactly. Russell Wilson's, um, in Russell Wilson's kind of farewell to, to Broncos country letter when he was not thanking thank, cafeteria members and yeah, didn't, it was... didn't thank Sean Payton, didn't thank the front office or anything like that. So it feels to me like Russell Wilson's going to want to take as much money from the Broncos as possible, which Stick means to him, yes. that he's going to have to get a little bit more than the vet minimum. <laughs> so he says he is, he's, he's been tripping to us. Apparently don't, we don't recommend this kids. Stoney, you need to, you need to get help. Um, yeah, it is fascinating. Um, gosh, I had something to say, and then Stoney, Stoney on the Tussin just completely threw <laughs> We, we, we can move on to the next topic. Here, that, Roshan, the next question. Roshan, Roshan the next asks, question. someone's got to explain all of the Adunze hype to me because watching him, mm. I just see Corey Davis, solid player, good size slash feed, oh, man. but visibly not enough explosiveness or twitchiness to be dominant. Do you have any you thoughts start, about that? You want to start? You can give your thoughts, and I'm pulling up my notes on him real quick. I, I mean, he he's one of the most... I think I think what we saw at the combine, he he was one of the most impressive guys, like in the gauntlet drill, which is one of the biggest drills at the um, at the combine for wide receivers. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most impressive drills I've seen since we've seen kind of Justin Jefferson's uh, kind of gauntlet drill that he ran about two, three, four years ago, whenever that was. I mean, he displayed how to do it perfectly. And I think that is something where, Adunze's it's it's kind of weird to talk about these top 10 prospects as if they're at their ceiling right now, right? Right. I, I think that's I think that's a little interesting to look at, right? Because they they haven't even played a game yet. We we don't know how truly good they can be. And seeing that their floor is here, I think with the traits and the athleticism that Adunze has, I think he deserves to be in that top three conversation with the yeah, other two wide receivers. Roshan says Corey Davis. I, I couldn't disagree with that comp anymore like the comp that i i've you know i was talking to our buddy danny kelly about his comp for him and i think that this is pretty accurate when you watch on tape he's like a, a slightly quicker Devonte adams and i'm not saying he's going to be Devonte adams but from a play style standpoint it's it is that guy right big body 6'3 212 pounds but moves like he's significantly uh less heavy than that um, really, really solid hands. Did a, I think that there's been a little bit of an enlightening this offseason of like, wow, look at this guy that was thrown in the ball. Like, uh, you know, not not to totally just put down Michael Penix Jr., but I think that there were a lot of plays that Rome made where he was bailing out Penix Jr. and 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 you know there weren't a ton of plays where Penix was setting up setting up for perfect success. You you watch the tape. Stoney says the Larry Fitzgerald comp for Rome is one that I've heard as well, and I I, I can't disagree. Like it's it's a very similar st play style. Steady Eddie, wide receiver one, inside outside versatility due to the size and the athletic ability. Um, he's you know he's got the frame. He's an intellectual guy. I I think he's the guy I was most impressed by. You mentioned at the combine from his, just being at the podium. The way he handled himself at at uh, at, at the actual testing, being the, the top guy testing and wanting to compete and like staying out on the field is a little hokey that he's like doing the same drill over and over to try to get his time. And that these like these guys are getting timing him. It's like, let these guys go home, Rome. A little bit hokey. Yeah. But is, is it sending a message of like, this is who I am? It is. I, I think that that matters. And he 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 impressed me a lot with his maturity 
with his just his mentality. The only red flag I got was that he thinks he can't land a plane, which I, I need him to do. I need if he comes to Tennessee, I'm going to gaslight him into thinking that he can because I need that delusional confidence in him. But besides that, I love the guy. And, and Stoney says, yes, say it, Easton. So many underthrows from Penix. It was a lot of just jump ball, YOLO ball, Hail Mary type throws that Rome made it happen, ran under the ball, adjusted, played the corner properly. Like he, he's done a lot of things with those really big, strong hands, impressive ability at the catch point. I don't know what I'm trying to think of negatives for like they're there. You know, his route running, not the most refined in the world. He's not as explosive as a neighbor's. I don't think he's as explosive even as a Marvin Harrison Jr. Necessarily, but his, his running, you know, his, his 40 time, his, his, his explosiveness in the 10 yard split above average, per perfectly acceptable for, especially for a guy of his size. And so um, maybe not the most dynamic weapon, uh, in this class, but man, he's close. And with that frame, I'm willing to give up a, a little bit of explosiveness. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree with you there. And then the final question before we talk about some, uh, of news today, Alex also asked what flavor ice cream is Ricky Pearsall? Oh, I've been marinating on this one. I think I'm going to go, I think I'm going to go, you know, like rainbow sherbet. I think that's what Ricky Pearsall is. <laughs> is that a diss? I explain. You can take you can take it however you want. I just no. when I think of Ricky Pearsall, I went my brain immediately went to rainbow rainbow sherbet. Huh. I'm gonna say. I just I just googled flavors of ice cream. To uh, you know, I'm gonna say birthday cake. Here's why: one, uh, he's white, and that's a white cake. Or it's a white uh, ice uh, flavor. Um, that's part of it. But that that aside, I think that he's like he's like the the pretty vanilla ish looking guy that is a little bit underrated. And if you hate birthday cake, this is a comment doesn't work for you. But I love birthday cake. Uh, I, I think that he's somebody that's going to be a mid day two pick, and he's going to make some team really happy. I think that folks are underrating him a little bit when we get to our top ten positions or top 10 players each position series, which is going to start soon because like the draft is coming and we need to start. Uh, I I think that I'm going to be higher on him than most. <laughs> Stoney says it's because of the leg test. That's part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the sprinkles and the, the strips of icing in your birthday cake ice cream. So I, I'll go birthday cake icing on him because I think he's a little bit underrated. He's kind of vanilla looking on the surface, but I think that where he goes, he's going to be sneaky impressive in his rookie year. All right. You want to move on to some of the biggest uh News items of the day. Can I, one last thing in the comments. I, I saw Alex also mentioned uh, Marcus Whitman at PFF, or he's not actually at PFF. He's I, I don't think did he did I miss something? Is he running no, at PFF now? TFG, the franchise TF, guy. TFG. Okay, Marcus Whitman. TFG is his, is his YouTube page, and we love Marcus. We met Marcus at, at Mobile this year for the first time, and he's I've been a fan of his content for a long time. He knows what he's talking about. He had the Titans in his I guess a recent mock trading back to thirteen and getting Amarius Mims tackle out of Georgia. Is that a little bit reachy with the lack of tape? I think it's an interesting conversation. And of course, we're, we're going to spend a lot of time on that with Stoney, by the way, in our top series or whatever on, on tackles uh, coming up. I keep I really should be more formal about this. Our top 10 positional series for each position in the 2024 NFL Draft Tackle Edition. That's going to be a show. We'll condense the name, but that's coming up soon. And we'll talk a lot about Amarius Mims then. But for now, just like your short answer, I I don't think... I don't think it's that crazy to think he could be at the 13th overall pick and it not be a reach. Uh, I mean, if the if his shuttle time was actually <laughs> Stoney, if the Titans take him as at 13, I will become the Joker. What just like trying to burn the city? What does that mean? If his if his three cone time was actually legit and it wasn't an error, oh, I would say oh, yes. Oh. That, Why'd uh, they have to do that to us? I don't know. Now I'm never I'm never trusting any break like if anything impressive that ever happens at the combine again i'm not buying it until 24 hours later it's still confirmed because you you've you've burned me on that yeah um i don't i don't think it's crazy it wouldn't be my choice depending on like i would take i would take fuaga over him i would take jason latham over him clearly both of those guys and of course ola fashionu and uh joe alt but he's that like if, if those were somehow all four gone, wherever the Titans traded back to 13, 17, 18, if Amarius Mims was the best guy and those four were gone, I would have no issue with it. I, I think the only thing that really concerns me about him is I think folks are overblowing JT, the lack of tape, the lack of games played in college or eight or whatever it was. And they're underselling his injury risk. Like he played in eight college games. He only finished six of them and he hurt himself running the 40 
at the combine. He, you know, he just, he's one of those guys that seems to have a, you know, freaky God given frame that you're like, this guy was born on Mount Olympus and it's a blessing and a curse because it's like, you're too big not to just constantly be hurt. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. Um, it, it's also just kind of the knock on him, which continues to be how much of how much of that truly is going to translate to to the next level because of how little uh, he has played. Now he kind of retorted that, saying he couldn't have played anywhere better, which is the University of Georgia, True. and going True. against some of the tough, toughest competition in, in at the college level there. But still, it is a big concern. Okay, let's let's fly through some news and then we can get out of here. Yeah, let's talk about first the the guys who got franchise tag today. So these are all the guys who will unfortunately not be available to the Titans unless they were to trade for them. Sorry, okay. guys. Um, mm-hmm. But let's start off with Kansas City, who officially franchise tagged Legereus Sneed. Carolina finally got it done tagging Brian Burns. Cincinnati, of course, Good. we know, uh, tagged T. Higgins. The Baltimore Ravens, between Justin Matabike and Patrick Queen, decide to tag Justin Matabike. Tampa Bay Buccaneers tag Antoine Winfield Jr. Chicago also taking another secondary player off the board, tagging Jalen Johnson. Indiana, Indianapolis, um, with no surprise here, tagging Michael Pittman Jr. And then the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, tagging Josh Allen. Easton, any of those guys really surprise you here, or is that pretty much chalk? No, I'm just glad we're finally getting to not talk about you know free agent T. Higgins, free agent Michael Pittman, free agent Legereus Need, free agent Jalen Johnson. Those were like the top four names talked about for the Titans and free agency. Like, go get that guy, Tennessee. And we're all sitting here saying, okay, they're not going to like, maybe one of them is like, maybe one of the cornerbacks is available, but that's, you know, that's probably not actually going to happen either. And here we are. They're all tagged the best guys available suddenly are much further down the list, much less inspiring. So no, I'm not surprised by any of those guys. I'm, I'm mostly curious now to see, you know, T Higgins tagged on day one, I think of the period to be able to tag folks. That's typically indicative of it's, you know, it's trade base season. Like we, we made a little tag and trade action. Let's see who wants. And we're going to kick the tires on the market for T Higgins. Cause we don't, we're not necessarily looking to get a long-term deal done with this guy. If you, if you, Take Pittman, for example, the polar opposite. He gets tagged at the very last second before you can't tag a guy anymore. That's because the, the Colts are seemingly genuinely interested in and acting on, you know, trying to get a long-term deal done with him. And that that tagging him at the last second, that just shows good faith. Like, we, we did it only because we want to make sure you're here, but we're going to keep working on this thing. If you tag the guy immediately... What is that? What message does that send to the receiver? It's like, dude, you know, we want to, we want you for next year, unless we can trade you, and we need as much time to be able to do that. And if not, then we're not going to bother talking about a long term deal. You're going to be here, and then you're not going to be here. End of story. And so I, I'm curious to see with a guy like Pittman, do they get a long term deal done? A guy like uh, Legarius Need and uh, Jalen Johnson, do they get a long term deal done? Because the Titans, we don't expect them to be full force next year, right? They're probably going to have a very important offseason coming up in 2025. And so a T, a T Higgins, a luxurious need could be really, really valuable guys coming off of their franchise tag on the free market for the first time, actually this time. And so that's just something that, that we're going to have to continue to monitor. Yeah. So that means that some of the guys who didn't get tagged or released today could be very interesting options for the Titans. Let's talk about three guys on the Jacksonville Jaguars who were all released by the team today, um, which in that move cleared up about $20.5 million in cap space for the Jacksonville Jaguars. What are they building in there? I, I, I'm not sure. What's they he already building in there? They, they already had a decent amount of cap space and their right. situation was fine, but that usually is indicative of making a big move there. Um, but the three players that they did, in fact, uh, release is safety Rayshon Jenkins, uh, cornerback Darius Williams and defensive lineman Foley Fatukasi, which are mm-hmm. all three very plug and play starters that that the Titans could look at as well. It's no, not none are bums. The They're all playable players. They're all in the realm of possibility, as we saw last year. Rand Carthen signing a former Jacksonville Jaguar and Arden Key. Could he mm-hmm. continue to go to the to the well of uh, unrestricted free agent Jacksonville Jaguar players? Possibly. Um, and then a couple of other guys who, who can, I think- can we real can I address that real quick? I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm curious. Does any one of those guys, like if you if 
if I had, if I made you pick, does any one of those three guys in Jenkins, Williams, and Fadakasi stand out to you more than the others? Because for me, there is one. Uh, for me, it's Darius Williams because I think that Same, at, I at, yeah. at the uh, position of need in the free agent market, cornerback, it, it's very scarce since a mm-hmm. lot of the guys like Legereus Need and others, Jalen Johnson, have now come off the board. Having a guy like him, um, who I think would fit the mold of what the Titans want to do, I think would be an interesting one for them to go after. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that Darius Williams is interesting. He's on the wrong side of 30. I think he's going to turn 31 this upcoming season, but he had the second most passes defended in the NFL last year among cornerbacks, according to next gen stats behind only Charvarius Ward. And so uh, it's a sought off position. It's it's a not the deepest position in free agency. Um, he had a really he, he had like maybe the best year of his career last year. Um, and he's at 30 years old now I, with cornerbacks. I get it. Like it's scary once that three gets in there on their age, but you're, you're a team in the Titans that you could go, you know, go get them overpay for one year. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's not going to make or break your season. I'd imagine. And, and so I think that he's something that is an interesting player they could potentially target. And then let's talk about a couple of other notable releases and cuts that happened today or yesterday mm-hmm. or in the past couple of days. First of all, the the Patriots letting Michael Onwenu uh, go mm-hmm. and walk in free agency. He's a very interesting, uh, versatile lineman that the Titans could look at. Are you in or out on him on a, as a potential tackle? Because I know he played. They they played him there in a pinch in New England last year. It was fine. Like it it worked. He's primarily like I think originally he's a guard, if I'm not mistaken. I think that I don't, I don't think that they would see him as that guy personally. Personally, I think that just bringing him in would do the Titans good because they really could use alignment at well, any I can't four out of five positions sure. on this. Sure, on this you know team. what? You and make a good point. Able, uh, yep. to, to, he's proven to do so. So I think he would be, I, I, I agree with you there. If they weren't to bring back a guy like Daniel Brunskill or didn't like any of the in-house options to get a guy uh, to mirror on the right side of Peter Skronsky and him could be an interesting let idea. Me, let me refer, let me rephrase it. They, they go, they sign Michael on to whatever the deal is to be the tackle does, does. Well, no, they don't say that they, they bring him in. We don't talk to the Titans about it. We don't have a press conference yet. Just you hear the signing. Does it in that moment change your mentality on what, like, does it change the math in your head on what they need to be okay at tackle next year? Does it factor in for you at all? A little bit. I think so. I, I think that, okay it wouldn't r- rule out the possibility of them drafting a tackle at, at one Oh seven. Um, but it makes it less likely. I think in my mind. Okay. Fair enough. Continue. Let's talk about the next guys here, starting with defensive tackle, Christian Wilkins, who is a, is an interesting name to look at. If the Titans wanted to go big game hunting, they could bring him in who would make an, uh, absolutely instant impact next to Jeffrey Simmons. And it would probably become the scariest, interior line in the entire league a couple he might other be the most surprising cut by the way yeah, just because I, I, I know a lot of folks were kind of expecting christian wilkins to like of course he's going to stick around they'll figure it out they don't tag him which a lot of folks thought they may the, the, the dolphins were kind of, you look at their their books money wise they were kind of all in last year like they, they they're not going to be able to get a whole lot better in free agency at the very least because letting go of a guy like christian wilkins that has nothing to do with his level of play that's a that's a tight pocketbook move right because wilkins can play and you're right it, whoever ends up with him is going to significantly upgrade the interior of the defensive line yeah i would agree with you there um two other interesting left tackle specific guys who will be on the market old man tyron smith from the da- from the dallas cowboys will be an interesting option and then Bill also ties and then also charles leno who is from the washington commanders who still needs to undergo hip surgery I'm not sure if that would be a great Wait, option really? for them. I did not know that um, this offseason they need. So you got 33 year old Tyron Smith mm-hmm. and Charles Leno, who's on the donor list for a new hip or something. Yes, correct. I, okay, gotcha. Um, so Sounds great. not not the greatest, uh, not the greatest option. Go sign those there. tackles, guys. Go um, sign those tackles. <laughs> we can move on to the secondary position here, where cornerback J.C. Jackson is available as the Patriots cut him as well. And then two guys from the same team in Seattle, uh, both safeties, Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams are moving off. I think Quandre Diggs is a really interesting option. I think that was not not, not a, not Jamal Adams. Uh, I, I that think guy. that was a move Anyways. that, that would, that they were going to make, but Quandre mm-hmm. Diggs is kind of a surprise there. I wouldn't be mad if he was in two tone blue and then a very a interesting player. one. I think is Marcus May, who has some ties as well to to the Titans here. 
Um, he was released by the Saints earlier today. He could be a very interesting option for them to pursue in the safety department. Sorry, I'm yawning. I'm, it's, I'm still tired from the combine. Um, yes, I agree. Marcus May is a guy that um, I don't. I guess I wasn't paying great enough attention. I was surprised they released him. Apparently, it's not that shocking. Um, so he and and Quandre Diggs are the two guys that I have my eye on as. Yeah, I would not mind if they went and addressed that at all. And I think that that's certainly a position they, they need to address. And so those guys are near the top of the list of, of potential guys. Finally, three more guys here at the tight end position, even though the Titans don't exactly need a tight end. But mm -hmm. uh, two of the three are very interesting options. First of all, tight end Logan Thomas is finally hitting the market. Uh, and then tight end CJ Uzoma from the Jets and tight end uh, Hayden Hurst from the Panthers is hitting the market. Hayden Hurst and CJ Uzoma uh, notoriously were on that uh, Bengals Super Bowl run team. And they were very interesting targets for Joe Burrow uh, during that Super Bowl run. It kind of yeah. got both of them paid in the offseason. So it could be a really interesting addition if they... Uh, want to bring them in a, as a run blocking option instead of Trayvon Wesco and still have oh, and obviously that catch, have that. They have the that Brian Callahan ability. connection, right? I mean, yep. they, they, they're familiar with the head coach. And so you never know. I, I tight end is not a position. It seems like they need a guy, but they certainly could use a body or two to compete in camp. And um, they've got the money to spend in that regard. Um, Alex in the comments saying he likes Hayden Hurst is certainly a possibility as well. So I, I wouldn't be shocked at all. There, there really isn't a position on this team that I would be shocked they sign in free agency. I think Even quarterback. This, I, I think, would you be shocked if they signed one of like the top three running backs and like Saquon or Josh Jacobs or someone other Nate, other? Than yes, yes, Eric Henry? that's yes. That like one of those guys or Kirk Cousins that I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. Nobody else in free agency will surprise me. No one. Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that it? We got everything that, that, that is it. That that's the rundown of the free agency news today. All right. Well, just like uh, Stony, it feels like this. Oh, this is, clicked the wrong one. There we go. I ruined my own joke. It feels like the show is off the tussin just a little bit. So we'll be done for today. Uh, we appreciate all you guys that tuned in with us live today. Very informal conversation. We will have a, a more much more organized show for you coming up. I will be out of town on Thursday, but I'll be doing the show remotely. We will uh, have some conversations about free agency as that approaches. We'll have some thoughts on some guys then. And then next week, some of my least favorite listeners to this show, you are, I have good news for you, in in uh, luck. You're getting what you've wanted for a long time. You're going to get an episode of the Hot Read podcast that I'm not on, that, I, that, I'm, that just I'm not involved in at all. It's going to be the producer JT Hot Read podcast show, the host JT on that day. And uh, he is probably, I don't know, may or may not have somebody joining him, but they're going to talk about whatever the heck they want to talk about. It's going to be their show that day because I'm going to be traveling. So if, if you hate me or you just love JT or a combination of the two, mark your calendars Tuesday next week. You'll tune in just like me, and I'll probably be in the comments spamming hate if they, you guys are making fun of me, which I expect you to do in my absence. Yep, I'm excited for it. It's going to be a I'm, good time. I'm sure you are. I, I can't wait to see what happens. Um, until then, until Thursday, when we are back here live on Broadway Sports Media's uh, YouTube channel, on 440's YouTube channel, on Twitter. Follow us at Hot Read Pod on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Follow us uh, by subscribing on those YouTube channels. Big help by doing that. We'll be back on Thursday for producer JTM, your host, Easton Freeze. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you then. Uh -huh.